Hello and welcome to an undisclosed location. This is Murder Incorporated. I am Buddy. And I am Harley. What would a serial killer look like before the advent of CODIS and the National Fingerprint Database? A man could travel and kill without any unwanted attention from the authorities. A true evil man roaming the county, hunting everywhere he went. This is Roy Melanson. Thank you, buddy. That was amazing as always. Anytime, man. So, this story starts July 10th, 1974. To give you some perspective, Godfather 2 is out. Okay. What a great movie. And Blazing Saddles came out that year. Oh, even better. We got Benny and Jess playing on the radio. Okay. Okay. Now, 51-year-old Anita Andrews was a single mother running Fagiani's Cocktail Lounge with her sister. They inherited it from their father after he passed away. Okay. She was divorced, a dedicated mother, working at the bar and also working at Napa State Hospital. The bar they inherited from their father seemed to be more of a burden than a blessing. Okay. Anita and Muriel were the only two employees working at Fagiani's due to the simple fact that they, the bar could not sustain any employees. It just didn't make enough money. Okay, yeah. It's heyday was in the rearview mirror. All right. They were both anticipating selling the bar to the first person that offered them any money. And to lure prospective buyers, they needed to maintain their liquor license. So they had to be open 25 hours a week. Neither of them enjoyed working there. Too many old memories and closing up on this, this side of town could be scary at night. Okay. So when they opened up this place, it was a nice part of town. All right. But now, you know, it's years later, it's really not that nice part of town anymore. Yeah. It's kind of run down. So Anita was a very beautiful woman, even at the age of 51. Very neat and fastidious about her appearance. She always had on her Belova watch and a black diamond onyx ring. Belova. Yeah. I that knew you liked that. Yeah. That was my first watch. Yeah, I remember I that brand. I yeah. remember. Mm-hmm. And um, so she'd wear this ring so that customers that didn't know her would just assume that she was married and not be hitting on her all the time because she's right. very beautiful. All right. Yep. And she was very well liked by the patrons and respected, though. Mm-hmm. About every night, whoever was on duty at the police station in town would cruise by the bar with the spotlight to make sure that they closed up okay. All right. So back to the night of July 10th, 1974. Sounds like the bar was very well liked around the neighborhood, at least. Then. The father was liked, you know, in the town. Yeah. And they knew that knew them. They grew up with them. Yeah. Okay. And um, so when Muriel left, it seemed like any other night. All but one stranger sitting at the bar. The stranger at the end of the bar was being harassed by the other men. So Anita told them all to leave, but let the stranger stay while she closed up. Uh oh. Which was very odd because she would not do this. All right. So this guy just charmed her into thinking, you know, it's mm-hmm. safe with me. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Seems like the uh, other guys were right to harass this guy. I got a feeling. Well, he was like hiding his face and acting sketchy. Mm-hmm. But then when he was talking to Anita, he was like wo- not wooing her like he was going to date her, but you know, he completely brought her defenses down. Yeah, yeah. Probably just acting like a sad old man or sad guy that just. You know, typical bartender kind of. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So the next morning, Muriel received a call from her mother asking her to check in on her sister because she didn't even show up for work. Oh. It's very out of character for her. So she worked at the bar, but she also worked at Napa State Hospital. Okay. For the mentally insane and criminally insane. So when she didn't show up to work, they called her mother because they couldn't get a hold of her. It's very out of character for her. Mm-hmm. So she drove over to her sister's apartment, but she didn't see her Cadillac there. Hmm. But she decided to check anyway, and she wasn't home. And then Muriel decided to drive over to the bar and see if she was there. The first thing that she noticed is that the door wasn't padlocked like it normally was. Hmm. She entered and noticed that the bar had been wiped down and clean, all but one stool and an ashtray at the end of the bar. Hmm, who was sitting there, I wonder? Yep. Then she noticed that the swinging doors to the storeroom were closed. That's odd, she thought, because they're never closed. So she pushed through them and discovered why. Uh Uh-oh. 
The half-naked, bloodied body of her sister lay on the floor oh, in a pool of her own blood. When Napa police officer Joe Moore responded to Muriel's call, it was about 9 a.m., he found Muriel in a complete state of shock. She was just like, I think my sister has been raped. You got to go check on her, make sure she's okay. Okay. She had no idea what the situation really was. She didn't know? even check the body then, huh? She didn't want to believe that she was dead at all. Uh, she was in total denial. Okay. So she pointed over to the storeroom. Officer Moore could immediately see that Anita was dead. Mm -hmm. But he also noted that she must have put up one hell of a fight. The scene was very disturbing. Broken glass and blood everywhere. Oh, jeez. Like, there's blood all over the walls, all over the beer cases. The ceiling had blood splatter all over it. Wow. Not to mention there was a pool underneath Anita. Yeah. So, Moore called for backup. He put out a bolo for Anita's Cadillac before securing the scene. Yeah, because the Cadillac wasn't there, huh? Yeah. So, obviously, it had been taken by somebody else. Mm hmm The Napa police called in an out-of-town criminologist to process the scene, which is not out of the ordinary for a small town when they have a, they're not going to have a lot of murders. Yeah, yeah, they don't have them on staff. Yeah, that makes sense. Taken into evidence was a cigarette butt in the ashtray, a shot glass, and a spoon with a fingerprint on it. Hmm. The front of the bar seemed to have been pretty much wiped clean. He did find the murder weapon, a screwdriver. Oh, oh, geez, a screwdriver. Wow. Anita had been stabbed with a screwdriver. Her pants and underwear were off one leg and still on the other. The same old story we always hear. Yeah. Her blouse had been opened and her bra pulled down. Jeez. And she had one high heel on left. Wow. What she was missing, though, was her Belova watch and her black onyx diamond ring were taken, hmm. along with her purse, her credit cards, and all the money from the register. And, of course, her Cadillac had been taken. Wow. So this was a rape, robbery, murder, everything, all in one. Yeah. Men's size, bloody footprints made their way from the storeroom to where the now empty safe and cash box lay. This had to be just the strangest scene to see. I mean, yeah. really. Especially in a small town like that, you know? They said it was so odd because everything was cleaned up except for the murder scene. Yep. Everything is wiped down and mopped the floor, and, and then there's just this, these blood trails yep. of the footprints going. Well, it seems like they should be able to uh, interview those people that were at the bar, and they Definitely. should have a victim or a, um, a suspect. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The stranger from the night before was an immediate suspect. Yep. And a description was given by the other patrons. The evidence from the scene and from the autopsy painted a pretty clear picture. Anita was struck from behind with a beer bottle before being dragged into the storeroom. Jeez. To be furthermore assaulted with the screwdriver along with being viciously raped. The evidence showed that Anita fought her assailant every step of the way. Good for her. Taking blow after blow about the body. Man. And 13 stab wounds with the screwdriver. Wow. Lucky number 13. Oh. But one thing is that they assumed that she was raped because of how they found the body. Mm -hmm. But because of how badly her body was beaten, they couldn't definitively say at the time whether she was raped or not. Mm -hmm. So the neighborhood was canvassed to find any sort of clues or at least someone that saw something. Right. Nothing. Nothing at all. There was so little to go on that soon this became a cold case. Hmm. This was always on the back of the investigators' minds, though, and the townspeople's minds. I mean, this thing just didn't happen like this. Yeah, yeah, especially they didn't figure out who it was. Couldn't yeah. have been a regular then. And where's this car? Yeah. That's yeah, the right. weird thing. Exactly. They they're like, well... They, they never found the car? No, they're like, once the car shows up, then we'll know. And yeah. just nothing happened. Wow. The only lead they had was that the night of Anita's murder, her credit card was used at a gas station. 60 miles north in Sacramento. Okay. The attendant did notice that the man had blood on his pants, but the guy, like, seemed so sure of himself and not nervous at all that the gas station attendant just let it go. He's like, the guy doesn't seem really? like, maybe he's a butcher. I don't know what he thought, yeah. but the, he's like, the guy's not nervous or acting weird. He's just completely calm. So there must be a good reason why he has blood on his pants. Huh. He had three words to describe the man. Calm, cool, and collected. Huh. <laughs> the three C's. The Cadillac disappeared after this and was never found again. That's crazy to think of. 
Yeah. You know, you'd think they'd be able to find the, at least the car. I mean, you ditch it or something. Now, nowadays, I guess they'd find it easily, but it's just nuts. It really is. It's the seventies. So August thirtieth, nineteen seventy four. This is only six weeks after Anita Andrews had been murdered, but eleven hundred miles to the east. Wow, you took that caddy pretty far, huh? Yeah, Michelle Wallace was temporarily living in Gunnison, Colorado. To say that Michelle was full of life is putting it lightly, okay? She was absolutely living her best life. She went skydiving, mountain climbing. She was also into martial arts training. Like, she was a very independent young woman, and she was carving her own path in life for herself. Mm -hmm. And she saw the beauty in nature, the beauty in stillness. And she wanted to share that gift with the world through her photography. Oh, great. And she really had a knack for it, everyone said. But while photography was her newfound passion, it was not yet what paid the bills. So she worked as a flagger for a construction company. Okay. This is where she met her friend, soon-to-be roommate, Teresa Erickson. They quickly became friends on the job and soon moved into a house together. Teresa, Michelle, and Oki, her German shepherd. Her and this dog were inseparable. Okay. They went everywhere together. The love of a dog. Yeah. Can't beat that. And that's what everyone said that it really was a bond between them. Mm-hmm. So Michelle would oftentimes go hiking and camping in the mountains to take photos and to explore Okay. for days at a time. So not unlike that she would disappear for a little while, huh? No, but Michelle was not naive, okay? She knew the risks involved with hiking. Like she could get hurt or something could happen. So mm -hmm. before she would go, she would say, okay, she would call her mom. I would say I'm going Monday. Okay. If I don't call you by Wednesday, something's happened to me. Oh, smart then. Because it's not that she was worried about somebody hurting her, but just that she could get hurt. Or yeah, yeah. By she's an so animal smart. or yeah, she was smart. Very smart. And she wanted her independence, but she also wasn't stupid and she wanted people to know where she was. Sure. So four days into what might be her last hike of the year before she was moving to South Carolina for a photography job. She decided to head back to town. It was like a mile walk back. It was late afternoon when a beat-up car pulled up alongside her. Two men inside, and the one man offered her a beer. She's not much of a drinker, but she was like hot and sweaty. She's like, can I have a sip? Just like that, you know. Okay. The men said that they had to head up the roadways, but would be coming back through and could give her a ride to her car. It was hot, so she accepted. That's well, 70s, I mean. Yeah, of Why course. not, right? It was, and it's a small town. It's not, you know, New York mm -hmm. City or something. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, by the way, folks, this is in Colorado. I don't know if I said that. Yeah, I don't know if you did, but okay. I, didn't, I didn't catch it if you did, so. This is in Colorado in the United States of America. A few minutes later, they were back, and Michelle and Oki hopped in the back. They only made it a few hundred feet further before they heard a loud clang, and after inspecting the car, it was obvious. A rock had pierced a hole through the oil pan. Michelle offered to give the men a ride the rest of the way back once they reached her car. Huh. The driver of the car, Chuck Matthews, hopped into the back of Michelle's car with Oki. The other man sat on Roy. Roy was a good-looking man, even if he was much older than Michelle. Michelle dropped Chuck at the bar, and Roy asked if she could bring him a couple more blocks to his truck, and Michelle obliged. Chuck thought to himself he shouldn't leave the girl alone with Roy, but he was an alcoholic, and the whiskey was calling his name. Ah, uh, gotcha. He, he said, I just literally needed a drink. Otherwise, I would have stayed with the, this woman. Oh, jeez. But he admitted it. You know, he had a problem. Mm -hmm. So on September 4th, 1974, when Michelle didn't check in with her mother, she immediately knew something was wrong. Michelle, yes, was an independent, free spirit, but she always checked in on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Margaret Wallace, her mother, phoned the Gunnison police to report her daughter missing. She was so sure on the telephone that something had happened to her daughter while camping and hiking. She was in Schofield Park, she told the sheriff, who answered the phone. It was not uncommon that a hiker take an extra day up in the mountains, but the mother was right. She could be laying there injured somewhere, so the police looked into it right okay. away. Yeah. And then within a couple of days of not finding Michelle, or her car, a massive search ensued. I mean, massive. Good. They had the Gunnison County Sheriff's 
the Civil Air Patrol, the Monarch Search and Rescue Team, Mount Crestview Police Department, wow. the Marshal Service, and deputies from neighboring counties and hundreds of volunteers. Mm -hmm. This was a massive search. Wow. As soon as they, like the next day, they couldn't find the car even, like where she normally parked, mm -hmm. and it was a bright red Mazda. Okay. So they are like, I missed that. Yeah. Officially, Michelle was listed as a missing person. But unofficially, two detectives, Porterfield and Fry, suspected that she was more than missing. Mm -hmm. It had been several days, and not even her car had been located. And it would have stuck out like a sore thumb. Yeah. The police went to Michelle's apartment and asked Teresa, their roommate, to identify items that only Michelle had used. Teresa gave them a brush and some eyeglasses. The detective Fry was only 24 years old himself. And this was his very first case. Really? Yeah, as uh, an investigator. Wow. But he did everything by the books. Okay, you got to remember, this is 1974. Mm -hmm. and they're saving a hairbrush and bagging it up for evidence, saving her eyeglasses. Yeah, I mean, this is before DNA was really yes. a big thing and all that. So, yeah. But in researching this case, I thought, like, okay, there was no DNA. There was no testing for it. Mm -hmm. But they were aware that one day they could test for it. Yeah in the future so they saved it they're very smart these detectives mm -hmm. they did everything right everything right good so on september 6th chuck matthews was watching the news when he seen a report about the missing michelle uh -huh. and the police were asking anyone with tips to call in chuck immediately recognized the woman as the woman that had given him and roy a ride he phoned the police and informed them that the last time he seen her was august 30th when she had given him and his friend a ride where she dropped him off at the Columbine bar and she took off with a man he had only met a day earlier. He believed his name was Roy. So Chuck didn't even really know Roy then? Not that well. Okay. And he believed that he worked for a sheep rancher in Schofield Park area. Okay. But he didn't have a last name. Okay. Chuck said that he waited for Roy to return to the bar with his truck to give him a lift back. And let me guess, he never showed up. Yep, Roy didn't show up. He just called for another ride and didn't give it another thought. You know, the guy just didn't show up. Mm -hmm. This is not what the investigators wanted to hear, okay? No. The next day, news got worse. When a rancher called into the police to inform them that he had the day before killed a dog matching Oki's description. Oh, man. So in Colorado, in this area, if you have sheep or any animals that are like a herd, mm -hmm. you can shoot dogs on sight. For bothering them. Mm -hmm. You have that right. Oh, so he, the dog was chasing his sheep. And so he uh, shot the dog and killed him. Yeah. Jeez. And they didn't even need to dig up the dog because he saved the collar, which had Oki's name on it and Michelle's. Oh, man. This is like horrifying as an investigator to think it just keeps getting worse. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we can't find the car. Now we find her dog. She's not with the dog that was very protective of her. Pieces are adding up. It's not looking good. No. It was further evidence that something happened to Michelle and that she had not simply vanished or moved on. So on September 11th, Chuck's story about Roy being a ranch hand led the police to Frank Spatafora's sheep ranch. Okay. He said, yes, indeed. He did have a Roy working for him. And he would do them one better. It was Roy Melanson. Oh, we got a full name now. Yeah. Okay. He showed up here looking for work with not much more than the clothes on his back. And I had to fire him for his laziness and not just not coming to work at all. Okay. <laughs> he probably didn't come to work because he killed this woman. The police at first just had hoped to find Michelle injured or lost. Yeah. But now they, they knew deep down that this Roy Melanson had something to do with it. They just knew it. Mm hmm So, 37 years old at this time... Roy Melanson was a six foot one man with thinning hair and a silver tongue. He was also a nightmare for many unsuspecting women throughout the U.S. Oh, great. He was born February 13th, 1937 in Louisiana. By the time he was 20, he was already well known to the police. Yeah, joy. In 1956, he was given a two year suspended sentence for forgery and impersonating a federal officer. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know the old, uh, oh, come with me, miss. I'm a police officer. Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. He was trying one of those. Mm-hmm. And this is in Corpus Christi, Texas. While on the two-year suspended sentence in Texas, he was arrested for a string of burglaries in Louisiana. So he, like, bounces back and forth his whole life between these states, Texas, Louisiana. Okay. It's really odd. Yeah. And I don't know if you know, this is how it starts for rapists and that end up being a murderer, is that they do the burglaries. So at first it's enough to watch people when they don't know you're watching them. Mm -hmm. And then you want to be in the house when they're not there and go through their things. And then that's when you, uh. and then you, you further move on to confront them finally. So most rapists were burglars at one time. It's like a drug where you just want you just want to keep getting more and more and more. That's a good, exactly that's a good yeah. way of putting it. Yep. Yeah. So after he's arrested for the string of burglaries in Louisiana, he served only a year of a four year sentence. Within six months of his release, he was charged with a much much more serious crime. In 1961, he violently attempted to rape his first cousin. Oh jeez. In Pinehurst, Texas. Wow. You know, once again, we get to this point where they had him in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. This guy is like, um, got Crisco all over his body, slippery. You know, when yeah. this guy gets away, it's unbelievable. Oh, great. So, he was sentenced to 12 years, but he served only six, being released in 1970. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> For a rape. August 1972... He was arrested again for raping a woman or in Orange, Texas. Jeez. The woman testified during a preliminary hearing that Roy and another man stopped to help her with a flat tire on the side of the road. When they realized that her spare was also flat, the man offered her a ride into town to get it fixed. Roy found an excuse, a way to split him up with the other man, and then as soon as he got her alone, he lunged at her. Oh, jeez. He told her she was getting it. That's not how he put it, but that's what he said. Okay. She was getting it, and the more she fought, the more violent Roy was with her, punching her, hitting her, oh, threatening wow. her. And it's just so sick because every little thing he did to her, he would, like, explain it before. He, this is what's going to happen, and then he would do it. Oh, this man. is what you're going to do, and you better do it. Oh, wow. What a sick man. And he was sodomizing her every step of the way. Oh, God. Making her perform sexual acts on him also. Which I won't even mention. Thanks. The assault went on for an entire hour, threatening her life the entire time. Okay. Once he finished, though, he apologized for the rape. Sorry about the rape. <laughs> Sorry I raped you, you know. Can we forgive this? Let's be friends. And he fixed her tire. <laughs> and then the whole time she's memorizing his license plate. And she remembered where he threw out her tour underwear. She made a mental note. So later on she could show the police. Yeah. And she could draw them a clearer picture. Mm -hmm. After changing the tire, he apologized again. And as soon as he was out of sight, the woman called the police to report the rape and kidnap. Wow. And it was good because she memorized his license plate. He was not hard to find. Well, that's good on her part. But jeez, man. What balls. Sorry I raped you. Jeez. I'll still fix that tire, though. Good for him, you know. He had the, he had the decency to at least fix her tire. It's just crazy how, how things escalate like this. Yeah. So before the case could even go to trial, Melons had made bail somehow and just fled. Yeah. Wow. So for two years, Melons had stayed under the radar, as far as they know. Mm -hmm. In 1974, he was accused of another rape, this time of a 17-year-old. He at first seemed like a good Samaritan when he pulled into a gas station where she had also stopped to find some gas. Well, hold on. He was accused of another rape, but he should. There shouldn't there be a warrant out for his arrest because he fled. Oh, there definitely is a warrant out for his arrest. Yeah, so yeah. they should be able to nail him with like no bail and all right. Anyway, keep going. There's warrants out. Yeah. Okay. So at first he seemed like a good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. He pulled into the gas station where she was also getting some gas. At this time, I don't know if you remember. Well, you, neither one of us remember because we we're too young. But there was a gas shortage. I don't know if you in the seventies. Yep. You remember that, where you had yep. to like. We were too ticket. young. We, we weren't even born yet. No, no. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, just, yeah, you had to like, storage, yep. get a yep. ticket and go and get yep. gas. Yep. So this gas station just didn't have any gas. Okay. But Roy was a nice guy. He knew of a place to get some gas, and he would be glad to help her. He was such a great guy. Once he had her alone, he abducted her, hmm. taking her to Louisiana. Oh, jeez. Continuing to rape her over several days. Oh, wow. Horrifying. What a poor woman. 
This has got to be every woman's nightmare. Yeah. Like, he viciously and thoroughly raped her. Oh, wow. She, like the woman before, was threatened the entire time he's holding her captive and raping her. He's telling her, you're going to die. Today could be the day. In the next hour. So it's every second of every day she's being raped, tortured, mentally, by thinking that this could be the end. Oh, my God. So he had to be talked down if she was going to escape with her life. Yeah. So she was smart. She pretended like she liked Roy. Okay. And that she'd even call her family and tell them that she was going to be a couple more days. She was going on a trip. And this earned his trust. Okay. He even showed her his driver's license. (laughs) But before she could testify against Roy Mellinson, she had a horrible nervous breakdown and was institutionalized. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so terrible. In the meantime, Melanson fled. Of course. See you later. There goes that Crisco. It's really nuts. It really is insane. Like, So in March 1974, Roy was living with his pregnant girlfriend in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, geez, great. Now he gets to reproduce. They got in an argument, and he left. His whereabouts are a little sketchy from there. But what is known is that he wandered on over to Colorado, where he talked Frank Spagnola into hiring him as a ranch hand. Now okay. it's coming together. Roy Melanson could talk the paint off a car. <laughs> Everyone that met him said the same thing. He was a world-class bullshitter. Okay. Like, he, you could flat out know that he was lying, and he could talk you into believing him. Oh, really? He was the okay. smooth, smooth talker. Mm-hmm. He's a salesman like you, buddy. That's right. <laughs> we know how to sell. Sell lies to an Eskimo, man. Yeah. That's right. There's this guy. Like, every single person that was interviewed, every interview that I read or heard about, that's the same thing as I like. He could just tell you anything. He could make you believe anything. Mm-hmm. He can make you believe the sky's green. Mm-hmm. Just that kind of guy. Yeah. So Mellison didn't really have a lot of time to work because he had met a local family staying in a cabin nearby, the Burtons. Okay. Lucille Burton and her five daughters were staying in a cabin in Schofield Park. Great, five daughters. This is yeah. perfect for him. And her husband was back in Pueblo, so this is a perfect fit for him. Oh, man. Man, this is like candy in a candy store. They weren't staying far from the ranch that he was working at. Candy in a candy store? This is like... <laughs> Kid in a candy Back store? again. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't much of a cabin, but it was soon home sweet home to Melanson. After seeing the young, beautiful daughters, he ingratiated himself with the family. They believed him to be a worldly man. He would speak French, and he was a traveler. He had an interesting life, and... They just wanted him to be a part of the family. It's that silver tongue, man. It's just unbelievable. Can you imagine some 35-year-old guy being like, hey, can I come hang out with your 14-year-old daughter? Yeah, no, no. Like, goodbye. that good at talking to people is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So he took a special liking to the 14-year-old. Jeez. Oh, Sally Burton. Spending all of his time with her and not working was the reason that Spadafor fired Roy. Okay. This works out perfect now because then he could just move into the Burtons. When it came time for the Burtons to head back to Pueblo, Roy actually talked the mother into leaving Sally behind with him. Are you serious? Yes. What? I just don't understand this. I don't, I really don't see any any world where that is possible, but it did. No. They're like, oh no, we had no idea. We, had, we just thought he was like an uncle to them. Oh my God. No idea. Wow. So, soon afterwards, Sally wanted to go to Pueblo. She didn't want to be there with him. Yeah, I don't blame her. So, he locked her in a cabin and kept her prisoner. Oh, my God. She was something that he'd locked up and that would bring out when it was time for sex. Oh, my God. He never hit her. This is horrible. He didn't have to because Sally never dared to say no. Oh, that poor girl. Yeah, 14 years old. Jeez. On August 28th, Melanson finally let her take a bus back to Pueblo. She was basically held captive in the cabin, tormented, sodomized, and fearing things would get worse. And now she's considered one of the lucky ones. <laughs> you know? Oh my God. They should escape with her life. That's what everyone says. But no, she's not lucky at all because now she's got horrible trauma. Probably PTSD. I mean, oh, yeah. her, her life is probably over now. I mean, I can't even imagine what she what she's living right now. How could you ever have another normal relationship again? No, exactly. That poor woman. Yeah. 
So Roy decided that he would join the Burtons in Pueblo, meet the father. Oh, great. What? Yeah. <laughs> what is wrong with this guy? So he was going to take a bus to go see them. He missed little Sally, huh? He missed Sally. So Jeez. he buys a ticket, but he's got time to kill before the bus departs. So Roy decides to check out the bar scene and see if there was anyone to scam or even something a little better, a little darker. Oh, yeah. That's where he met Chuck Matthews. Oh. So they struck up a conversation. And by the end of it, he had Chuck convinced that he owned his own cabin and horses, but he had a bear problem and needed to get rid of the bear. So they're, you know, by this time they're loaded. Yeah. He's like, sure, I got a gun in my place. Let's go get this bear. <laughs> okay. He said, we'll go out on your horses and go looking for him. Mm -hmm. The two men took off for his cabin. But by the time they reached Burton's cabin, it would be too late to look for any bear. Roy also had a story about the missing horses. He lent them to someone, and unbeknownst to him, they hadn't returned them. And you know what? This guy owed me money, too, he said. <laughs> so we better head over there and get it in the morning. <laughs> what? But since Chuck's car was such a piece of crap, Roy brought his tools with him also so he could fix it along the way. Well, okay. As the crow flies, his supposed friend lived about 10 miles, but you had to go around the mountain. Okay. So it's like a half hour drive each way. <laughs> All right. So a crazy thing happened when they were trying to find this friend. Roy could not for the life of him find his friend's cabin. To top it off, Chuck's car had broken down a couple of times on the way. Mm, nice. Roy kept taking him down logging roads. First looking for the cabin, and then looking for the bear, I guess. At one point, Roy told Chuck to stop and get up. He'd seen the bear. Roy grabbed the rifle, and Chuck went a little off the road to get a better look. So when Chuck looked back, Roy was just putting down the rifle, as if it was aimed at Chuck. He said he had a look in his eye like he thought better of it. Really? Like he was going to kill him. Really? He was going to kill him, but since his car was such a piece of crap, he didn't bother. Yeah. I mean, that's just what they think. Hmm. Huh. So they decided to stop and get more beer and see about fixing the tire before heading back up the mountain. That's where Chuck and Roy had met Michelle and her dog, Oki. Wow. The next day, Roy walked into the J.C. Penney's to buy himself some new clothes. He left and got himself's Mazda. He wasn't worried about driving around because there was nobody reported missing. Mm -hmm. He got a hold of the Burtons and found out that Sally's mother and father were out of town. And one of the older sisters were in charge. They told him, under no circumstances do you come here. So he headed on over. He stashed the Mazda when he went to go see Sally. Okay. She said he looked like a new man. He had new clothes, and he had acquired some camping and hiking equipment. Also, he had in his possession a very nice 35mm camera. Okay. He even allowed Sally to take his photograph as he lay smiling on the couch next to one of her friends. Wow. I'm going to post that picture. Okay. Wow. It's just so creepy. Yeah. Like this old dude, just, it's so creepy. Mm -hmm. He looks like that uncle that you'd never want to be alone with. Yeah. I mean, he's good looking, but he's, you know, creepy. Yeah. Knowing what I know, he's creepy. Yeah. So on September 3rd, the day Margaret Wallace had reported her daughter missing, Roy pawned the camera and some camping gear. He signed the pawn ticket under his actual name. Okay. But later, with Sally in tow, he signed into a hotel with the name Alan King. He didn't give his license plate number, like he's supposed to on the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So the hotel employee waited till he wasn't looking and then just wrote it down anyway. Okay. Soon he was on the road again by himself, leaving Sally behind. In Oklahoma, he met 34-year-old Gene Wilder in a bar. Gene Wilder, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Melanson convinced Wilder that he knew a man in Colorado with a construction company that needed help. And he was a heavy equipment operator, so a perfect fit. What are the chances they meet like this? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have to assume he had plans to just kill Wilder and take his car. Yeah. Because why else would he, like, even bother with this guy? I don't know. He had a nice Cadillac, so, yeah, you know. He must like caddies. Yeah, exactly. I don't see why else you make up the story and make him go with him. I just don't see it. Yeah. Anyways, he tells Wilder he needs to drop his car off at the garage. And they can pick it up on their way back through. So he loads all of his belongings into Wilder's Cadillac. Okay. They end up in Colorado by September 12th. And when a caller drops a dime on a white Cadillac, suspiciously driving back and forth by a school. 
the police officer stops Wilder and Roy and is going to run their names but the computer's down. Oh. <laughs> it's like he has the best luck. Yeah. So Roy gives the officer a story about picking up a family friend, Sally Burton. The officer has no reason to believe otherwise, and he leaves. Mm-hmm. But shortly after, the police officer gets a call that one of the men, Roy Melanson, has a warrant for aggravated rape in Texas. Oh, great. He's yeah. like, shit, I left them at a school? Yeah. Like, he's freaking yeah. out at this point. Like, Yeah, oh, yeah. So he rushes <laughs> back to the school to look for freaking Roy, you know? Yeah, of course. He's not at the school. Nope, he's long gone. But the car was found at a motel in town. Okay. Wilder and Melanson were both taken into custody. Wilder gave them permission to search his car. In it, they found Michelle's driver's license, registration to her Mazda, an Amico card with her name on it, camping equipment, a Mazda toolkit, and an insurance card in the name of George Wallace. Okay. Pretty damning evidence. Yeah, everything they needed. But this is the next town over. This is not Gunnison. Right, okay. So the Pueblo Police Department were all over Roy. And one of them remembered that there was a bolo issued for a red Mazda station wagon. Okay. And it was owned by a Michelle Wallace. So they didn't know why, but they knew there's no good reason for this guy to have Michelle stuck. Right, right. So they phoned Gunnison and were informed that Gunnison had a charge for check kiting to hold him until they got there. Okay. But really, they wanted to talk to him about Michelle. Yeah. So Mellison played totally stupid with the police saying that he didn't even know what a red Mazda station wagon looked like. Really? Yeah, that's what he said. Meanwhile, in the other room, Wilder's telling them that they dropped off a red Mazda station wagon back in Texas. <laughs> and it didn't take long police to find the car. Yeah. Once confronted with this evidence, Roy asked to speak with the FBI. He was a lifetime criminal, and he knew the justice system. Yeah. He told the FBI that, yes... He had dropped Michelle off at a bar and taken her car without her permission across state lines. It's a federal offense. Really? He was hoping to be arrested on federal charges for taking the car across state lines. Do the time for that. And then this whole Michelle Wallace thing would just blow over. Michelle's... He really thought that would work? Oh, yeah. He thought for sure. I mean, look how many times it's like he's just had so much luck in the past. Yeah, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Michelle's parents were, to say the least, a mess. Yeah. So the police finally have a man in custody. A man that was found to be in possession of her vehicle and virtually all of her belongings. Yeah, not to mention a whole bunch of rape charges. Yes. The same man wouldn't be charged for her murder. There's no body. Yeah. The man is going to walk free without a body. Yeah. They had never tried somebody without a body in Colorado at this time. Okay. Hopefully this is the first one. So Maggie, the mother, she could not be at peace not knowing what happened to her daughter. Yeah. She just wanted to know one way or the other what was going on. She knew something horrible must have happened to her, but not knowing what or even knowing where the body was, it just, you know, it ruined her. Yeah, I can imagine. So her husband, George, awoke the next morning, and at once he knew something was the matter. He immediately started to cry before he even looked at his wife. Really? He said, you don't sleep next to someone for 35 years and not know their every heartbeat and what their every breath sounds like in the morning. Oh, man, that's so tragic. He sat up and looked over at his wife. She appeared at peace finally since his whole ordeal. George knew his wife had gone on to join Michelle. Wait, what? She had taken an overdose of barbiturates. Oh, wow. Waiting for answers was too much for her to bear Not knowing what fate their daughter had met was too much for her to bear. Oh, my God. All that was left was a note that read, If you ever find our daughter, please bury her next to me. Oh, my God. That's so sad, man. He called the sheriff and told them what had happened, blaming them, obviously, that they hadn't found his daughter. Yeah. So now that man took his wife, he said, and now, or took his daughter and then took his wife. He wow. did not believe that they were doing enough to find his daughter. Of course, you never do. No, of course not. He's from Chicago, so he didn't understand the sheer immensity of the area they were searching. Mm-hmm. This is not, you know, a couple square miles. Thousands and thousands of acres. Yeah. After Maggie killed herself, George was sad, but then he became angry. Angry that she did not love him enough to stay with him until the end. 
Yeah. See it through with him. Yeah, I mean, that's a heavy thing to bear. Yes. You know? Yes. Absolutely. I can't imagine losing my child and then my wife. Yeah, that's just in the terrible. same month. Yeah. It's so tragic. I mean, I can't imagine bearing your daughter. I, I, I don't even know if I could even handle that myself. But then just doing that to your your loved one who's going through the exact same thing. It's so rough. Yes, I agree. Mm. I agree 100%. That was well put. November 1975. So Roy is taken back to Texas for the rape charges. His trial starts for the rape of a woman. The day the victim was set to testify, she just never showed up. Really? She lived six hours away, so the trial went on without her. And Roy was acquitted of the rape by a oh smart female defense attorney. Oh, man. No, With no victim, it's very hard to prosecute a rape charge. Yeah, absolutely. I can't believe he was acquitted. It was later proved that a woman called the victim the day before, claiming to be from the prosecution's office. A deal had been made with Roy, and she was no longer needed to testify. Are you serious? To this day, it's not known who called her. They have no idea. So you think it was that defense attorney? I don't know, but it's like some woman that was on his side. Wow, that is terrible. So another trial would begin shortly after for the second rape victim. Remember, there's two. Yep. This time, there would be no hiccups during the trial. And he would be found guilty of rape. And under the habitual, the habitual line stopper, basically, the third strike rule, he was sentenced to life in prison. Oh, good. Yep. So for the people in Gunnison, this was good news. Mm -hmm. At least when they found Michelle's body, they would know right where to find Roy Mellinson. Mm -hmm. And they never stopped looking for poor Michelle. It is to date the largest manhunt in Colorado history. Looking really? This girl, yes. Wow. Literally thousands of police officers and volunteers were used searching thousands of acres. Jeez, man. It was as if the earth opened up and swallowed her whole. That's terrible. Then, in 1976, a hiker found a mass of hair parted right down the middle. Really? So it's not a ball of hair. Just imagine if somebody scalped you. That's what he found. Oh, wow. So the perfect set of hair remains were found. Wow. It was given over to the Gunnison police, and then from there it made its way to the FBI crime lab. Wow. This energized the police again. They thought, well, maybe her body's going to, you know, show up nearby. Yeah. So they mounted yet another monumental search. And they just pulled out all the stuff. We've got to find her this time. Let's push one more time. We'll find her. Huh. Hey, I got, I got something to say real quick. So if you're in Colorado or anything, if you remember anything about this, and you want to tell us about it, you can uh, send it to uh, murderincorporatedpod at gmail.com. Or you can actually get us on Twitter at, at Murder Inc. Pod. So please let us know about anything you like in these stories. And, uh, you know, we want to hear from you. So if you remember any of this stuff, if, you're, you're, if, if you've been a part of this, you just want to hear or talk to us, check us out there, you know? Yes, we love hearing from any listeners. Always, yeah. always, yeah, always. absolutely. But keep going, Harley. So, there. Without something of Michelle's to match it again, they couldn't even say positively that it was hers. Okay. But the last photo of her seeing her hair was done exactly like that, parted down the middle, and two pigtails. Oh, uh, okay. Or ponytails. Right, right. I don't know if there's a difference. I'm not a girl. But anyway. I don't think there is, but that's right. <laughs> so the hair went back to evidence for six long years until Kathy Young was put on the case. Okay. Who's Kathy Young? The first ever woman investigator for the sheriff's office. Okay. And nobody knew it right then. But right then and there on that day, Roy Mellinson's evil ways were finally catching up to him. Here comes in the good old prison snitch. While going through Michelle Wallace's files, Officer Young found not one but two affidavits for men that served time with Mellinson. They okay. said that he admitted to killing Michelle. Really? And the thing is that they never told the public anything about the dog or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then when the officers mentioned that the dog was the dog was dead, he said, wait, Roy, Roy told me he didn't kill the dog. 
which he didn't. Okay. The guy at the ranch didn't. Right? right, right, yeah. So they knew there was something to this. Okay. And he said that Roy told him that she had extensive dental work done. How would he know this, you ask? Well, buddy, Melanson knew this because he had smashed her teeth out with an axe to hinder identification of the body. Was it ever to be found? Oh, my God. So he literally separated her jaw from her body. Jesus. These men sound incredible. Yeah. They knew things that, how could you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's just so sad. Like, how else would you know about Melanson and the dog and dental work? Yeah, yeah. If these were never released to the public, then... And it was adding yeah. up. Yeah. So she's like, well, you know, this is more evidence for when we finally do can hammer this guy. Yeah, absolutely. This was exciting. But things wouldn't go much, much further. Mm. 1988. Melanson had become somewhat of a jailhouse lawyer. Oh, great. And somehow, on his own, got his third strike thrown out. So he what? was resentenced to 33 years. 12 of which, by this point, he had already served. So in March of 1988, he was released. What? Time served. Wait, wait, March of 88? Yep. So he, he didn't even do 33 years. He did 12 of the 33, that's it. And then he got released. With no parole or anything. Are you kidding me? And he murdered another man in prison, which they knew that he murdered this black man, but nobody wanted to be a snitch and tell that it was him. But everybody knew it was him. Are you serious? This slippery mofo. It's unbelievable. He's a very smart guy. Unbelievable. So now, 51-year-old Melanson moved into the household of the son he had once abandoned in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> oh, jeez. The couple was renting an apartment from Pauline Klump in Port Arthur, Texas. Shortly after, Melanson had moved into the apartment... Man, I thought the story was getting to the end. It's not, is it? <laughs> so shortly after Melanson had moved into the apartment, the landlady came over to see if Roy could help her bring a TV from the car into her house. No big deal. I got you. Yeah, he's, he's a good guy, you know. He's, he's, he's helping out all over the place. The next day, her car was found in a grocery store parking lot <laughs> with a TV still inside. But Pauline was nowhere to be found, and neither was Roy. Oh, jeez. About a month later... Melanson found himself in Walker, Louisiana, a small town east of Baton Rouge. While hanging around a laundromat, he overheard 24-year-old Charlotte Soren gossiping about how long it would take for her fiancé, Vincent Lejeune, to save money so they could buy land for a home. Mm -hmm. In that moment, Melanson stepped in, presenting himself as a land developer with a sensible <laughs> offer. Oh, jeez, that slippery... That silver tongue of his. When the other people left the laundromat, Melanson attacked her, viciously raping and tortured this woman. Oh, my God. Before eventually strangling her and slitting her throat ear to ear. Jeez, this guy's just, he just loves murder. He just loves violence. Like He's like in berserker mode right now. Yeah, he, 12 years in prison, he can just stop. Like, you, you got away, all right, just live your damn life. He, oh, my God. It's unbelievable. He then tied a strap around her neck, dragging the body all the way near the couple's shed. Wow. Where he dumped it. So her fiancé was a mess. Yeah. He did not believe that that was her body. The police, it took like four police to hold him back because they didn't want him to see the gruesome scene. Oh, jeez. The worst part is he was a suspect all this time. Really? Like, the whole town thought it was him. It was horrible. Everybody oh believed God. it was him. Like, he was getting constantly questioned by the police over and over and over again. Yeah. He's like, I cooperate with everything they want. I wanted to find a killer. Yeah. He's like, then I realized, oh, you're not asking me to come in here to help. Yeah. You're trying to slip me up. Yeah. He's like, it's not going to happen. I have nothing to hide. Yeah. That's so like horrible. It, this is like the peripheral things that happen when a serial killer is on the loose. Yeah. Yep. Like, it's so sad to lose the love of your life and then to be accused of killing her. Yeah, it's like you're not going through enough. Exactly. Yeah. So in 1990 now, Kathy Young, the investigator for the sheriffs, was horrified when she found out that Melanson had been released two years earlier. She called the Texas Rangers to get statements 
from the women he had raped to maybe get some clues into Melanson's psyche. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was on this case. Like, yeah. She had other cases going on, don't get me wrong. But this was always in the back of her mind. When she had time, she would go through the files again and again and again, trying to find something new. Yeah. Something that they could take to trial against him. Yeah. She was also informed by Taylor, the ranger, that he was arrested again for burglary. The ranger also informed her that he was the prime suspect in the disappearance of another woman, Pauline Klump, from Port Arthur, Texas. Jeez. All she could think about is how many women are out there that he had murdered. Yeah. Like somebody traveling around the country, it's, it's clicking in her head now, like, this guy's never stopped. Yeah. He's been doing this the whole time. Yeah. It's so sad. This this is just unreal, man. Yeah. This is absolutely unreal. Like, this guy just, he's so slippery that it just, it, I mean, how long has this been going on? Since the 70s, and we're in the 90s now, and he's still killing. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous. He's been caught. Yeah. Like, it's insane. Yeah. So, September 1991. This is almost 20 years since Michelle Wallace had gone missing. Mm-hmm. Young was going to try something different. She got a hold of Necrophile. Have you ever heard of them? No. No, what is that? So this is the very beginning. This is where I want my body to go when I die. Okay. So there's, this is not the place, but there's farms. Okay. So at first they started with, they bury pig bodies and see how vegetation grew so they could mark it down. Like if a body's buried here five feet, this is what it will look like in six months. Okay. This is what it will look like in a year. So then they survey an area and look at well, what looks different. What matches. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. I, I've heard of that. Yep, okay. So they have a body farm in Tennessee. Okay. This is where I want my body to go. You can choose what they do with you. Okay. So if you say, okay, I'm donating my body to the body farm in Tennessee. I want to be hung. And then you see how my body decomposes while being hung. <laughs> or I want to be put in a trunk. No, they yeah. will do it exactly how you want. Okay. Yeah. So cool. So cool. And they're catching bad guys. I mean, they... These people have helped investigators immensely, immensely huh. with manhunts. Yeah, that's and awesome. And it started off with pigs. That's that's awesome. And this huh. is one of the very f- big cases that they helped with in the beginning. You know, there's big as 70. Now they're huge, they're everywhere. Yeah. So, Young located almost all of the witnesses from the first go-around at Melanson. Mm-hmm. Wilder had passed away. She did talk to Sally Burton. She was still around. She had much to tell the investigator. Yeah, I can imagine. She told her how he kept her in the cabin and that the fear he had instilled onto her. Sally was still traumatized as many years later. I can imagine. Just failed relationship after failed relationship. She didn't trust men. Mm -hmm. And she was mentally unstable. I mean, of course. Of course. course. Yeah, it, it all makes sense, you know, that poor girl. The initial inmate to come forward was hard to find. Okay. But not impossible. She finally tracked him down, but a note, there was like a note written about an address, and she said, I'll oh, check this place, and it ended up being where he worked. Okay. And they didn't want to tell her anything. She's like, he's not in trouble, he's not in trouble, because they knew he was an ex-con. Yeah. And he was trying to better his life, he was doing good, he did his time, mm-hmm. he was not, he was on the up and up. Yeah. And she's like, no, it's nothing bad, I just want to talk to him. So, what he told her, 16 years later, from his original affidavit, mm-hmm. basically matched word to word. Oh, really? So she knew this guy was telling the truth. Okay. His story did not change whatsoever. Yeah, that's good. Okay. This is all very promising. But without a body, it wasn't going to be a slam dunk case. No, of course not. But what they had on their side was, with all these years gone by, so if they had tried the case when she had only been missing for six months, the defense could say, well, she could be out and she could be in California. She could be in New York. Sure, absolutely. She could be doing anything. Yeah. But now that 16 years have gone by, she's never registered anything in her name. Yeah. She's never opened a bank account in her name, never had problems with the police, nothing. Yeah. Now it's more it's, likely it's something happened to her. It's pretty obvious, yeah. It was easier for them to believe, a jury, that something had happened to her. Mm-hmm. Finally, finally they would go to trial. He was convicted of the murder. Good. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. No death penalty, which is sad. Mm-hmm. He was convicted, and then September 2010. Oh wow! DNA links it. Okay, Anita Andrews. Oh really? The woman from the beginning. Yeah. So he left DNA on the cigarette butt. Yeah. And they got him. 
Good. So he was convicted of that crime. And then his DNA was also linked to the DNA also linked him to Charlotte Sauron. Oh really? Yep. Wait, which which one was Charlotte? From the laundry mat. That her ah, husband, her, yes, yes. Her okay. fiance. Ah, good. So So that's good, yeah. He so, was not tried for that though. Oh really? He already had two life sentences. He's appealing, of course, as well. Of course he is, yeah. He's convinced that he's getting out. Yeah, I'm sure he, wants he is. Parole. He wants but, parole. But I mean they got him. I mean they got the the DNA. I mean props for them for keeping that hairbrush. Let me I tell mean, you something. Yeah. They did an excellent job on this because they knew eventually this something would come of this. Yeah. The DNA linked him. Yep. To Wallace, to Andrews, and to Sauron. Yeah. They got him. It's like I mean, he should have definitely gone away for these rapes, and none yeah. of this should have happened. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely had him way back, but it was just slippery. He was so slippery. Yeah. And, like, even Young said that, like, knowing that he was a murderer, and then knowing all this about him, and then once he got in the interview room with, with him, he totally disarmed her. Jeez. He's like, i seen it happening, and it's still, he's just that much of a charmer. Yeah. It's crazy, man. I just don't, it drives me nuts about the, the one girl that... That was just talked from not showing up to the trial. You know, that drives me nuts. Yeah, I wonder who yeah. called her. Like, was it that girl that he impregnated? Was it the lawyer? Like, yeah. who was it? Yeah, who knows? I mean, yeah, they never could find out. They tried. They yeah. tried to find out, but they just, to this day, they have no idea. Yeah. What do you think, buddy, about that story? Oh, uh, insane, man. I mean, you want to talk about slippery. Holy crap. That, that, it just drives me nuts, you know? Thinking about how, well, I mean... It's kind of a good thing, and you can think of how how far the the evidence um, of our hang on, how do I word this? How far our justice system has come, and our ability to um, use evidence to like man. Um, Link, link crimes, crimes yeah. yeah, link crimes, and, you know, how far it's come since the 70s up to now and since, you know, way back when, you know, so we're doing a lot better of a job, but holy, you know, in the 70s, obviously, it was so, you know, just free range, you know, like lawless almost, you could do anything. Yeah, and the crazy thing is, like, too, that none of these police departments would talk to each other. That is insane. So you literally could kill somebody just... Three towns over, nobody would know. Yeah, that's insane. Like, it was, yep. oh, this is our murder. We don't talk about this with other police stations because we're going to be the ones to solve this. Yep. So nothing gets linked. Yeah. Like, unbelievable. Even when he had warrants out for the rape, and it didn't pop up when he got when he in another state. You know, it's like, yep. how does this stuff happen? Yeah, it's insane. Every yep. case we cover, buddy, and we've been doing this for 10 years now, every case we cover... <laughs> That's right. They have a lot of luck. A lot yeah. of luck is involved with being able to be a successful serial killer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, he was just slippery and he had a lot of luck. And that's what it was, you know. And he just, he knew what he was doing. Yeah. And that's what's sad. And that's what a lot of, a lot of these good serial killers, they get away with it because they know what they're doing and they're smart. And this guy was smart. Yeah, he was smart. Yeah. He was slippery, like you said. That was a perfect way of putting it. He's slippery, yep. man. Yep. And there's, I don't say this with very many... Serial killers because it's just is put out there too much. Oh, you had more victims. This guy had more victims. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, I without agree. A doubt. I he agree. Was all over the country. Yep, yep. There's just a lot of them weren't linked to him. Like but. there was years that the police had no contact with him. He was not just, you know, yeah. selling Boy Scout cookies. Oh yeah, he loved doing this stuff. You know, so there's no question about it that he did it somewhere where he just didn't get caught. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's really Sick. sad that his life was just. Inflicting pain on women. That was his life. You know what's, uh, I mean, we didn't hear a lot about his life, you know, his beginning. I couldn't beginning find of anything. Life. Yeah, that's crazy. The only thing I found is like, they did good in school. That was it. I didn't find anything about his childhood. And I looked everywhere. Yeah, that's Even crazy. The book, I read the freaking book three times. So I'm like, I'll, buy, I'll find something. Yeah. Nothing. It's just very little. Like what that's, I said in the podcast, that was it. That's crazy. That's insane. Yeah. I mean, it was mostly you could find. About the investigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, but if you go to like Wikipedia, there's nothing on there. It's just like his name and he killed however many people and then that's it. It's nothing about the trial, nothing. That's crazy. 
And um, I'd be curious how his childhood was, you know, and what what led him to be this way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really not. It's like I just think like this guy lived to murder and harm women. That was his life goal. That's everything he did was in hopes of hurting more. What a sick Raping man. more, killing more. Yeah, what a sick man. These poor women that just had to deal with this horrible, horrible man. Yeah. It's really sad how they met their endings. It really is. I mean, and, and they were just... And a lot of them, they didn't just have an easy ending. Well, a few of them that we know of, you know. I mean, Sally and then um, the one woman that, that he took to Louisiana. Yeah. Can't remember her name, but... Though they um, didn't release the victim's names. I only um, seen them, like, one place... So I thought maybe that was intentional. So I didn't put their names in there because I thought maybe they didn't want their names out there. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, he just, he, he tortured them for a long period of time. It's not like he just, you know, once and done. It's just, these poor women, you know? Yeah. It's horrible. It really is. It really, to just imagine the fear that must be going through your mind yeah. when somebody has you for days. Yeah. It's and horrible. that's so courageous to go to the police after and be strong and say, I will stand up at court. And yep. I will point my finger and I will say it was this man that did it. Yeah. You know how much courage that takes? Absolutely. Because he threatened them. Turn me in and I'll find you and kill you. He told yeah. them. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. And they did. They were very, very courageous. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have my anything else, buddy? No. Um, I mean, just that... Stay safe out there, you know? There's disgusting men out there like this. There's disgusting women, not just men. You know? And yep. I don't know. The 70s isn't all hippies. That's right. It's not all hippies and pot farms, you know? So, buddy, if somebody has, like, a question, okay, say they have, like, a burning desire to wonder, you know, what color your socks are, where can they write us? Um, I believe they can write us at murderincorporatedpod at gmail.com. What if somebody just wants to, like, talk to you on Twitter, though? They don't really want to email. Oh, that's easy, man. At murderincpod. And we are constantly on there harassing other podcasts. Yeah, we are, actually. <laughs> so, Aren't there a few shout-outs we got to do? Yes. And we also want to do two shout-outs. Two of my favorite podcasts. They're done both by women. The first one is Three's a Crime, a wonderful podcast, and they do a lot of research, which I respect. They do a lot of research, but they also lighten the mood because they have such good personalities and they have such a good sense of humor. And then, what's the other one, buddy? I believe that's Nefarious New York. Yes. It's just great podcasts, you know? Nefarious New York, I really love because they do podcasts about New York, all of their cases. And it's not like just New York City and stuff like that. It's all over New York. And we live in New York. And a lot of these cases I had not heard of, so I love that. And you can tell they put a lot of work into that podcast. And the two women are just great together. I love it. If you guys want to see some cool videos of, we were voted, I don't know if I told you guys this on the podcast last time, Buddy and I were voted the most handsome podcasters. Yes, we were. And I would like to second that because I do believe we are. <laughs> yep. So go to YouTube, look up Murder Incorporated Podcast, it'll pop right up, subscribe, and you will be entered into a raffle to win a basket Full of goodies. And when I say basket, I mean envelope. <laughs> Take the time to tell those that you hold dear that you love them. My name is Paige, and I'm the host of Reverie True Crime. Reverie means to daydream, but even daydreams can turn into nightmares. Join me as I tell you haunting and horrific reveries about missing people and senseless murders. I also interview survivors and people seeking justice for themselves or a loved one. New episodes come out every Monday morning, and sometimes you'll get bonus episodes on Thursdays. Wherever you're listening to this current podcast right now, you can find Reverie True Crime.